Hello guys, this is uh, Dr. Palne Parmanikam. In this video, we have a very, very special guest, uh, Dr. Julie Schatzel. She is my doctor. I brought her back a year ago uh, when the whole channel started on intermittent fasting. I'm bringing her back again for future updates and a few of the questions that I have and also most of my audience and my subscribers have as well. They have contacted me through email multiple times that please bring her back again. So this is um, where I thought that, okay, this is the best time to bring her back again, okay? <music> Thank you, thank you, thank you for being on the show again. Thanks, Dr. Pal. It's great to be back with you. Great <laughs> How have you been? I've been great. We got smoked out of our house, but um, thankfully, my parents live in town. So, you know, that big fire, we're, yes. we're kind of near that area. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Everything okay? So far, okay. Thanks, thanks to the valiant firefighters. Wow. They, okay. they are the bravest people I know. <laughs> oh my god oh absolutely i'm so glad that everything is okay um so so you know last year we had this talk about um time restricted feeding and i can't tell you how many people have listened to you and adopted this technique and they have uh, bought your book <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. time restricted eating and uh, it's available on amazon as well and um I, I've shared this experience with you as well. I've showed you the pictures about, you know, how um, much weight they have lost and before and after pictures. And I, those are the pictures that really keeps me going and keeps me and you doing what we're doing. Fantastic. I, I just get so excited when I see those pictures, Dr. Powell, because, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's telling me that people are harnessing their internal rhythm it's mm. it's it's a transformation that people make when they lose weight with this method this kind of weight loss through time restricted eating is honest weight loss the body mm. is losing weight because it's working better the metabolism is amping up it's very different than someone who's losing weight through dieting someone who's losing weight through medications mm. I'm not saying that that's terribly bad because weight loss is always good but the difference between these two types of weight loss people who are just struggling with diets and people who are finally becoming rhythmic they're using time restricted eating and seeing the weight loss come off is number one one's going to be permanent so you and I have both seen that through the years <laughs> People who lose time lose weight through time restricted eating, that weight stays off. It is it is like permanently off. I mean, they may fluctuate a couple of pounds here and there. You know, there's life interferences that come through, but using a diet or using medications, it's a constant yo-yo. Mm. Ruin metabolism. You just ruin metabolism. I I have people who tell me I am a I'm a three times success on, on, I won't say the name of the diet program, but they'll say I'm a three times success on weight blank, you know, and that means they've gone through the program three times. They've paid for it three mm, times, three times right. lost weight, gained it back, paid again, lost weight, gained it back. This type of weight loss, your body does not like because it's not natural. And but, it's, but the, but the program likes the program likes <laughs> <laughs> because they want you to keep coming back to the program, right? I mean, <laughs> and then the other type, time-restricted eating, it is, it's setting this, you know what I think about it is like, you have a setting, your body has a setting. This is returning your body back to default setting. It's just like when your computer freezes up. Reset. You know, running to, <laughs> this is, this is resetting back to default mode, which is, mother nature's pattern mm. this is this is the true pattern that mother nature embedded within us mm. and when you get to that rhythm and it's very precise so there are people doing time restricted eating kind of soft and there are people who would do who are doing it very precisely when you get to that precision you have reset back to default and you will start to see multiple multiple levels of improvement in health I see. I see. So it, it, both you and me, uh, we enjoy a lot when that response happens and when you see a difference. And, um, you know, the I, I have started telling people that the satisfaction that I get with this kind of response is even more than if I control a GI bleeder in the middle of the night. <laughs> 
you know, I think the whole health system is messed up because we're just treating the uh, outcome problem and not the actual thing that is causing the problem, right? So focusing on prevention. Um, so, so coming back to our topic about, you know, like how to follow this, so many people have emailed me that, hey, no, I followed this very well. Um, it's been three months. Um, I'm not noticing any difference. I know that you keep saying that, you know, keep doing it, but, you know, I'm not, my weight is gaining like 0.4 pounds and that is demotivating me. What do you use your answer? Okay. That is a great question. That's a great question. So they're at three months and they're doing something like, you know, they're finishing by seven. So they've mm -hmm. got that minimum time restricted eating interval. Mm -hmm. So they're fasting at least 12 hours. So we're getting the definition correct here, right? Yes. They're fasting at least 12. Mm -hmm. They're eating no more than 12. Yeah. Now, some people are on the more extreme end. They're eating only eight and eight. they're fasting mm -hmm. 16. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's anywhere between that range of eating between eight to um, 12 hours of eating and then 12 to 16 hours of fasting, right? Mm -hmm. So, And again, they're circadian. So you, we want to make sure that they're linking to the sunrise and sunset, meaning that they're not just changing that 8, 16 hour all over the place every few days. It's a different time that they're starting and a different time that they're ending. So if they're doing all of those things correctly and they're noticing that they had weight loss and now the weight is slowly creeping back up, there may be a couple of things going on. Number one, make sure that the weight didn't start to come back up after daylight savings. So if they're in a country where they're using daylight savings, daylight savings, that one hour can undo the benefit of your previous time-restricted eating interval. Mm. So you know, in the United States, I know that in October, November, right? I think we reset in, yes. in sometime in the fall, October, mm. or maybe it's November. Once we reset, everyone's time-restricted eating gets thrown off kilter. I mean, everybody's does. That one hour is such a large impact on the genetics of the original imprint the reason why time-restricted eating works is because of Mother Nature's imprint of clocks in the body. Mm. That, that daylight savings or, you know, fallback, whichever time that we're talking about, it will change metabolism when you start to just follow the new time. So if it's not because of daylight savings, the other cause, so the number two cause that it could be, is that we become comfortable with the time and we start to we start to drift with our eating. So we start to allow heavier foods to drift into dinner time. Mm. And when that happens, you have to think the time restricted eating has to do with your eating and fasting cycle to match mother nature's rhythm, sunrise mm. and sunset. Mm. If you're having a fairly large meal for dinner, that digestion time will be extended. Mm. You will finish at your time. I'm I'm finishing at like six or seven or five, but the composition is so heavy mm. that this this digestion is going on for another four hours. So when we are talking about time restricted eating, we're using your finish time as a proxy for digestion finish, right? Mm. But mm. it's really digestion finish time that's counting. It's, it's not really the time you, you last put something in your mouth. I so if I eat like a steak with all the trimmings and mashed potatoes and, you know, buttered vegetables, and I'm eating that at six o'clock and then my neighbor next door is having a chef salad at six o'clock, her end time. So her fasting interval is different than my fasting interval. Oh. She's going to have a longer fasting interval than I am because that chef salad only took 45 minutes to digest. Uh, and my steak and potatoes and vegetables took another three to four and a half hours. Mm. Now, it's not always composition. So always, so think about that. Is She could have a chef, chef salad and maybe she puts half a cup of canola oil all over it. Mm. And canola oil is not a healthy oil. Mm -hmm. Neither is certain seed oils. So there's a lot of seed oils that are very unhealthy. And maybe she even put some uh, canola oil with artificial sweetener. So there's a lot of dressings that are diet dressings where they say mm. low sugar, no sugar. So now she's put out artificial sweetener, canola oil dressing on her chef salad. Her digestion time will change. 
because of the bad additives, because of the inflammatory content of what she's added to that salad. So toxins like artificial sweetener and canola oil, I just consider like a toxin because it's a very inflammatory oil. It's not really mm. meant for us to eat. That will change your digestion time because the liver is now preoccupied with detoxifying. Mm. So now her chef salad, which normally would have been 45 minutes if she just put olive oil on it and a little balsamic vinegar, but now she's added these toxins, it's going to take two to three hours because the liver is having to detoxify. So you want to think of the digestive process is a lot of it's going through your liver and how much work you're giving it to do. Giving it a nice, healthy salad, steamed vegetables, not a lot of carbs, not a lot of protein, not a lot of fat for that mm -hmm. last meal gives the liver something very not complex to work on. It's not like a Rubik's cube. It's trying to like undo. Uh, if, you, if you give it like that big heavy meal, then it's a Rubik's cube. Mm. Or if you give it a toxin like, um, you know, the additives that we know are bad. Another Rubik's cube you've just thrown into the, you know, mm. mix. Mm. So having the last meal very clean, meaning that, you know, the ingredients, it's something that, you know, feels good after you finish it. It doesn't weigh you down. The density of the food is very light. Then you're good. Now, some people might be saying, Dr. Julie, you're just telling me to diet now. You're telling me to change what I'm eating. Well, if you've hit that plateau, then you have to look at that last meal. But here's the silver lining. The silver lining is you still get to eat what you want for lunch. Right. For breakfast, when you wake up in the morning, if you have a craving for something, you get to eat it. Mm. All I'm saying is that if you've hit the plateau, you need to scrutinize the last meal of the day. But that's it. That's mm. it. You're not scrutinizing breakfast or lunch or the things that you eat between breakfast and lunch. You still have the freedom to choose what you want to eat. I see. I was I was uh, talking with one of my one of my clients and. And I asked her, you know, how are you doing? And she, you know, she had lost like 13 pounds in a few months and she was feeling good. And I said, I know you're doing all the right things. Tell me what you're doing wrong and let me know if you feel bad about it at all. She said, well, every time I feel like having a donut, I just go and have a donut and I don't feel bad because mm. I'm so overweight. And I was like, that's perfect <laughs> because part of time restricted eating is you get to you get to have fun. Fun, right. You get to eat what you love to eat. It's fun. You could enjoy the journey. Yeah. I mean, you don't you don't have to say, oh, eat this, not that. You know, oh, that's bad. I'm I'm guilty. I should change what I do tomorrow. I'm gonna make up for it. None of that. You're not guilty for anything. You you get to eat normally as long as you follow that sunrise sunset pattern with your eating times. So the, um, um, the research shows that the maximum fasting or the minimum eating window, eight hour outcome is better than 12 hour outcome. Um, from 12 hour, you go down slowly up to eight hours and then you hit a plateau and then you focus on the dinner time. Um, so the, the problem that I'm facing is from my uh, patients as well is that they are, have this mental block that I need to eat a heavy dinner so I don't wake up in the middle of the night because of hunger. Um, so should they have to focus more protein, fiber in the middle of the, uh, for the dinner? Or you, you asked us to be on a lighter side, but can you explain a little bit more? So that's so true, Dr. Pal, about being hungry later in the night. Now, what, what, what I've observed in thousands and thousands of people over, over the years now is that the changes you want to make are small because you're actually changing the pattern of hormone release. Mm -hmm. So if there's this fear of being hungry later in the night or being very hungry in the morning, which is okay to be hungry in the morning, morning yes. the, the, the most uncomfortable time is before bedtime. Yes. So, so it's that like eight o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night. And you're going, Oh my gosh, I am so hungry. How am I supposed, you know, and, 
And that would mean that maybe someone is moving a little bit too fast uh, with making that dinner light or with their time. Mm. So someone who's just beginning now, you're not beginning. So this is something that, you know, you've been doing for years now. Mm -hmm. But if that hunger is still coming back, then it may be there's not enough fat during the day, number one. Mm -hmm. So you're not getting enough caloric intake during the day. And usually that's fat. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about healthy fat, avocados, coconut oil, olive oil. oil olive oil. Yeah. I mean, I have people who will just eat two tablespoons of olive oil during the day to make sure they get enough of the good oil. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so everyone thinks about protein, but think about what your brain, your skin, all the, all the things that help your nerves are made from fat. Fat lipids. Right? Mm -hmm. So you need enough fat in your diet or else you're going to be craving, craving carbohydrates. I see. And mm -hmm. that's what we want to avoid is we want to dampen down the cravings. And so that hunger in the evening, number one, I would increase healthy oils, mm -hmm. so add an avocado to your diet or add, add more olive oil, eat the olive oil, <laughs> get a good brand. Don't get a brand that's got, you know, stuff. Sometimes it can be adulterated. Right. And then, and then the other thing is calories. Like you said, maybe you're just not getting enough calories during the day. So it's hard to know what someone needs, mm. but protein is always important. Yes. And fat is always important. So I, I think it's usually missing. Someone's diet is missing one of those two things during the day. And then if they're still hungry later in the evening, then just increase the comp increase the, the amount someone's eating at dinner time and give it a couple of weeks. So remember it takes two weeks for the body to adapt to some change that's happening mm. with time restricted eating. Mm. So, so the discomfort should last for two weeks and mm. really no longer than that. I see. So that's kind of, a, that's kind of a reset that each person has to go through I when see. they're starting. It is a, is a two week period of discomfort when you start to change something mm. and the eight hour interval seems to be ideal. Now there are people who are doing something called extreme time restricted eating. And they're eating for four hours. Four hours, yes. But yes. I, I have people who have tried that. There's not a lot of longevity to that pattern because you're so offset from the rest of the rhythm of the community. Right, life. right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Then, then that gives us undue pressure that you are going to drop this method altogether. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Four hours is almost like you're really just cutting out calories. Mm -hmm. You're you're dropping two meals, you know. So so it's important that time restricted eating fits into someone's lifestyle. And if they're going to miss that last meal, they have to make sure they've had at least one big meal during the day or two meals during the day. You know, so I do have people, the ones who seem to have the most success. Mm -hmm. They've made sure that they've had at least some snacks or they've planned out their day mm -hmm. so that if they know they're, they're potentially going to miss dinner, they may just skip it because they don't want to have that meal at eight or nine o'clock at night. Now, if you do, if you do end up having that later meal, don't sweat. Mm -hmm. Don't sweat. It mm -hmm. only takes about a week to undo that, that fall off the, you know, fall off the wagon time. I so see. You can fix it. And I have people who mentally make that decision. They're like, I'm at so-and-so's birthday party and they just served cake and mm. I'm going to have it even though it's late beyond my time, but I'm going to stick to my time or adjust it up by an hour for the next week or two. When you say I just dial it down by an hour. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you kind of need to know your body. So yeah, you yeah. just kind of play with it a little I bit. See, see. Um, but if you if you just make sure you kind of dial it down a little, you know, you meaning you move your dinner up a little bit more, or you just keep back to that usual time, you'll still make it up. It'll be faster if you dial it up by an hour. But if you just want to keep your normal time, you'll get that metabolism back because there's this legacy effect. Mm. Like the studies talk about the animals can go off. They have legacy. The body remembers that original time. Mm. But you don't have legacy until you've been doing this for a while. So right. it's not like you begin and you've got the legacy effect. Right. I mean, it takes a while to have the legacy. <laughs> so so uh, what is your take on this low-carb diet in addition to this time restricted feeding is the outcome is faster uh, or if it is very difficult to follow will you just say low carb at dinner alone 
That is a good question too. I love that question because I'm going to compare this to, so, okay, let's go to extreme low carb, hmm. extreme low keto. carb, keto. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now keto has been around for hundreds of years. It was originally the Bantig diet. So there was this, he was a mortician in the 1800s. Okay. <laughs> and his name, his name was Bantig. That was his name. <laughs> and, and he was, they call him like corpulent. Like he was a big round guy, you know? And um, so he's going and he's got a lot of money. So is, I, I mean, that was, that, that was a job that made a lot of money back then. So he went to no, a number of different doctors to find out how he could lose weight. And, you know, they said, you know, they gave him all the typical recommendations that they probably are giving people now. But there was one surgeon who said, okay, Bantig, you want to lose weight? Just eat fat and just eat protein. And you can't have any carbohydrates. All right. And this is like, you know, 1800s, late 1700s, 1800s. So he did this and he started to see his weight go down and he was getting thin and he's a very, you know, like very gregarious guy. So he wrote about it and he did talks and everybody knew this diet is now the Bantig diet. The surgeon was forgotten who came up with it, you know, <laughs> so he was totally forgotten. <laughs> anyway, they still so, call it, it in Scandinavia. I think if someone goes on a diet, they'll call it I'm Banting. I'm I see. Uh. So, so this was very popular back then. Um, and now it's come back. It came back as Atkins many, you know, a yes. de couple of decades mm -hmm. ago. And now it came back and now as keto. What I've observed in people who are doing this extreme end of no carbohydrates, and they're really following the keto plan closely, is that you're, you do get accelerated weight loss because you're, you're using another bypass mm -hmm. pathway, metabolism mm -hmm. pathway. But um, the issue is longevity. Mm -hmm. And when you cut down carbohydrates so much, you change the production of possibly, and this seems to be what it's correlating with if you look at the studies, neurotransmitters. So you potentially could be putting someone in a bad mood mm. because they're, they're not getting the glucose they need to make the right kinds of neurotransmitters. And if they follow banting, they'll be panting. <laughs> <laughs> panting all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's just not a happy type of lifestyle. Right. People do lose weight very quickly, mm -hmm. but you're you're causing a ketosis state, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a starvation state. And then the body is using up and creating a lot of kind of toxins. Mm -hmm. So people seem to be pretty good for about a year, maybe two at the mm -hmm. really strong willpower mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. But I have not seen anyone with beyond that. longevity yeah, mm -hmm. beyond two mm -hmm. years, maybe 1% at three. Yes. But, but I have seen people do like kind of low carbohydrate diets and they seem to do very well. And, and that is just basically just making sure you don't take a lot of carbs in overall, right? I mean, there's people who count and there's people who are doing all different kinds of variations mm -hmm. of this plan. Mm -hmm. And they do seem to lo lose weight better because again, when you lower carbohydrates, you're lowering insulin, your body's making less insulin. Think of the diabetics. They take a vial of insulin and they have to inject themselves with insulin. Your body, your pancreas is making insulin That's just like in that vial, right? So if you make less insulin, you gain less weight because diabetics know when they go on insulin, they end up gaining weight. Gaining weight. So ultimately, carbohydrate intake is a proxy for how much insulin you're making. So mm. always low carb is, is always the better way to go. Mm. But if you're doing time-restricted eating, the carbohydrates get burned up during the day because your metabolism is so fast. Right. That's what TRE is doing. It's elevating, accelerating metabolism during the day and then allowing the body to have a complete shutdown in the evening. Mm -hmm. You can sort of get away with eating a little bit more of the indulgences during the day. So I would say to people who are really like, struggling with, oh, how many carbs do I take? How much, how much can I take in terms of overall uh, caloric carb content, glycemic index? You know, they're looking at all these things. It's more what time you take it, right? Mm -hmm. If your metabolism is going super strong, optimal level between 9 a.m. and 2 p.m., that's about when people max their metabolism with time-restricted eating, then you can have the carbs at that time. I mean, I, I know I have ice cream at that time of day. Mm -hmm. I won't have ice cream past like three o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, nice. So, 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 you know, if you, 
if you have to put some numbers to it so keto is like less than 20 30 grams of carbs um right I you know I don't know what people do in terms of like the the original keto. I know mm. it's something in that range. Something I think range, depending right. on what blogger you look at, you yeah. know, <laughs> different ranges. Right? right. 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 So it's it's just a matter of okay, if you want to get to that level of you want to be a bodybuilder, you want to you're you're trying to do some competitions on muscle mass and physique and that kind of thing because there are people at the extreme end using time restricted eating and monitoring their carbs to really get to that super athletic level mm. but if you're just a normal person and you have a work schedule and you have other people who are dependent on you your family yes. to yes. cook and they want to eat regular food it's very difficult to say that you're going to you know spend the money on only eating like um pork right. rinds right. and bacon and oh. you know stuff like that so i think it's just easier if people understand that make that last meal of the day clean start mm. with that mm. if you want to go low to zero or low to no carbs i wouldn't go no carbs because i really think that it it messes with your yes <laughs> your absolutely you know i'll tell you about from my practice what i've done is that hey you know i get a lot of indian patients uh, and then our diet is rich in carbs um so i make them jot down in my fitness pal i make them do that i know they hate me for that but i make them do that to understand how much carbs that they are taking per day and you'll be surprised on an average per day it's 300 grams without any control right so i said you know hey you know i'm not asking you to cut down to 30 or 20 right i'm just asking you to cut down to 200 so in that method with a slight moderation of low carbs and with this maximum 8 hour eating window i think it's golden julie i'm telling you i will not have any job <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome i mean i think i think looking at real data of people's experiences of where they see that needle changing you know the needle um, moving because they've reduced that carbohydrate content i i do it differently i i really just focus on the last meal and i really just have them move carbs around so so the reason i don't have people try to count their carbohydrates is because this is what i've observed mm -hmm. and and this is what people have have given me feedback about mm -hmm. is that once you get to a certain point with time restricted eating so say for example your 300 carb eating person yes. continues on time restricted eating and mm -hmm. they're at 4 to 6 months Mm -hmm. By that point their desire for eating carbohydrates will have changed on its own. You don't even have to tell them to think about reducing carbs. They will naturally no longer crave it. Mm. The the craving will be less. So the mm. adjustment becomes more intuitive, more natural. So I I typically tend to not have them do the arithmetic for it because I know over time they'll come back to me and they'll say I just I I didn't want to eat that or I didn't want to eat this. I just didn't feel like it. And this has happened over and over again. I, I had a uh, woman. She uh, had a um one of those red velvet cakes, you know, uh, and she loves red delicious, velvet. Cake. <laughs> and she got it at Cheesecake Factory. So it's not just red velvet cake. It's it's cheesecake red velvet <laughs> cake. <okay>? Right. <laughs> and, and she said, "You know, Dr. Julie, I would normally like eat the whole thing cuz uh, it's so delicious." But She ate less than half of it, put it in her fridge. Next day, didn't even feel like having it at all. It was a couple of days later we were doing our interview and she said, "You know what, Dr. Julie? It's still in the refrigerator. I haven't even gone back to try it or or I haven't even wanted to." Because the time restricted eating seems to be resetting hunger and satiety hormones. Mm. It's resetting ghrelin and leptin. And leptin. Mm. And when you reset And ghrelin's like I think of it as like the grr it's the hunger hormone it's the one that makes you crave food right. you know so when you can reset ghrelin it might be called ghrelin i'm pronouncing it <laughs> no i think that makes me remember <laughs> it's ghrelin grr you know so so when you start to reset that and again it takes several weeks for that to happen and it's a different time point for each person but when they reset that they will naturally curb 
the things that they are eating that are carbohydrates. It comes so naturally. And, and for you, Dr. Powell, over time, as you get into, you know, two years, three years, you'll notice that, that you, you may not even, it may not even like register in your brain that your food uh, categories have changed quite a bit from when, when you look at what you were eating, say a year or two ago, because again, it's so, it's such a slow, see, gradual process. Uh, uh, you will naturally, your body starts to become more in tune with itself. So it will start to say, oh, I need more vitamin B6. So I need more selenium. I need more, you know, it's, it's going to drive you to eat the foods for the vitamins that your body needs, because now it's, it's registering the body's sort of like in tune with the rest of the body. Ah, I see. Huh. So um, in the, 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 the problem that I'm facing is now is, you know, okay, so, you know, pal, uh, I'm, the main reason I'm adopting this technique is because I don't want to change my diet significantly, but you were asking me to logging down. And then um, one point of time, they get fed up of logging every day and then everything as well. Um, but at the same time, people are not patient enough to notice changes either, right? I'm not sure how to, um, to be honest, I'm really struggling with this right now. That three months, they're doing great. We started from 12, slowly 11, 30, 11, 10, 30, 10 hour eating window. The weight is not budging. The number is still high. And um, um, when I say low carb diet, they are not liking it. And then if they're going down to 9.39, they're not able to do it. So I'm saying that, you know, give it three more months time and they are not liking that as well. So how do I tell my patients, hey, no, this is a slow process. It's going to be a lifestyle change. And what do you do in your practice? Yeah, it, it you know, it's people expect rapid weight loss. Mm -hmm. And the weight loss is going to be as fast as your body will allow. Uh, so the key to understand, and so, you know, you and I both use liver tests, but, you know, people who are not patients in your community, they don't have liver tests to show you from the beginning of when they started at, and then again, at one month, two months, six months, one mm -hmm. year. But what I do with my clients and my patients is we do look at the liver tests because they may not be seeing a change on the scale, but we very, very clearly see yeah. the liver tests modifying because everyone's liver starts out at a different place. If your yeah. liver's got a lot of fat on it and it's inflamed, you're, you're, you've got so many more levels to clear before the body will allow this, this um, old inflammation state for the weight loss to come off, right? right? So yeah. everyone starts at a different place. Mm. Someone whose liver tests are two to three times normal has a lot more time they've got to put into TRE before they're going to see the scale change. Mm. Whereas someone who's already at normal liver tests don't have a lot of fatty liver, they're going to see that scale change much faster, mm. right? Mm. Because the weight loss through time-restricted eating is different. It's not just your body burning fat. Yes. It's your body doing that internal cleaning that it's never had before. Right. So I, I thought of this analogy, Dr. Powell, if, if your liver and all of your organs have these like highways in them, think of like, like a metropolis and they've got all these roads and, mm -hmm. and, and even, even smaller roads and alleys and passageways where merchandise can move, merchandise can move in and out fuel and things like that need to move in and out of this metropolis. So imagine that's your liver. It's got all mm -hmm. these highways in it. Now, if you've never done a time-restricted eating schedule, meaning that you grew up and your, and your parents sort of didn't really have a time you had to stop eating, that was like me. We never had to stop eating. I could eat right before I went to bed if I wanted to. You know, I could, yes. I could, have, a, I could have an ice cream bar and then go to bed. Right. So, so if you never grew up with that type of schedule. Oh, one second, one second. One second, yeah. one second. Hello? Hello? I mean, interview like a, can I call it back? Sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay, that's all right. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So, so if you grew up with that kind of schedule, you know, where you're just allowed to eat whenever you want, you never have practiced time-restricted eating until now. And so your highways, you can think of all these highways, have parked cars, garbage bags, people, maybe even people laying around. The whole town is just, it's just occluded with all this stuff on the roads. Hardly anything can get through and hardly anything can get out. That's fat on your liver. That means your highways are all clogged up. There's no efficiency in transportation. And when you start time-restricted eating for the first time, 
someone's going through and they're now cleaning up the city. All those roads are being cleared. Mm. And the longer you do it, the more alleys and roads and highways and streets that are being cleared off out, you know, being cleared off of all mm. that garbage that's been piled up over time. Mm. So once those highways are clear, now you've got cross traffic. Now you've got fuel, you've got garbage moving out, nutrients and things moving in. So you've got this efficient metabolism. Your metropolis is now functioning like it should be. Not all this stuff built up and people just laying around, you know? So that's what time-restricted eating does, is it cleans up the highways of your organs so that nutrients can move in and waste can move out so nothing gets built up on the sides of the road. Mm. And so someone who's trying to lose weight through time-restricted eating, this cleaning process needs to happen first before they see the scale change. And so the people that I see, some people lose weight very quickly within the first few weeks, first few months. And then other people, they have so much cleaning up to do. It might take them months before they see the scale change, but we see the numbers change on the blood test. I know their inflammation markers are going down. I know that their blood vessels and all of the nutrient processing is happening better because I see their blood sugar coming mm -hmm. down, right? Mm -hmm. Their blood pressures come down. So we have to use those parameters to monitor mm -hmm. the changes. If the weight, it's not just the scale because everyone starts at a different place yeah. on how tangled up the organ processes are. So the other problem that my patients are talking about is sleep. Um, it's not like, you no, know, we talked about this before in our previous video that, you know, it, you have sleep problems initially and then with this method and then it'll get better in like four to six weeks time. Um, but how about people who have true insomnia even before starting this method? And uh, I think I read some research that it actually improves the sleep habits down the road. But during this treatment process, how should we manage and what is your approach? Well, insomnia is one of the biggest challenges to almost all primary care and probably yes. other specialists as well. Yeah, because once you have insomnia, you've you've now elevated your cortisol level, right? right. So you've, you've elevated your stress hormone. And I just read an article. I was, it was fascinating. Cortisol goes into the brain and it circulates in the brain. Mm. And, and so the more cortisol your adrenal glands make, the more stress hormone goes into your brain. So we have we have so many reasons for the adrenal gland to kick in nowadays, you know? So insomnia is almost across the board, one of the primary, it's it's one of the primary things people look up in terms of like when they're looking at health topics. I see. I see. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. So, so number one, the problem goes back to melatonin, hmm. whether you have too much cortisol in the system or whether you have too much stress in your life or whether it's just um, like you just can't fall asleep overall, it tends to have to do with melatonin. So the one hormone we have that helps us fall asleep is melatonin. Mm. And when we don't have enough of it because we're not making enough of it, mm. then we can't sleep. Mm. insomnia. So that's the number one reason. Now, how do you make more melatonin, right? That's kind of the, that's, that's the crux that's the of the problem, um, right? Exactly. Is how do you make more melatonin? Mm -hmm. And the key thing is, and it's interesting because Dr. Panda not only discovered time-restricted eating, but he also discovered the mel the, the receptor in the eye that activates melatonin production. Right. right? So, so that blue light receptor. Yes, blue light receptor. So, so everyone already probably already is pretty familiar with trying to prevent blue light in the evening because mm -hmm. that just kills your melatonin. Mm -hmm. And the younger you are, the more that melatonin will be suppressed by blue light at night because young people have clear corneas, they have wider pupils, so they let more blue light in and blue lights, anything from an LED, your cell phone, your iPad, your lights inside the house, almost everything is LED, which means very powerful blue light frequencies. Mm. Pretty much all artificial light, when you go on, turn on any switch or anything that's bright at night, it's going to have blue light. If you're a younger person, 20s, 30s, it's going straight into straight, your brain, uh, knocking out that melatonin production, more so than someone who's like 80, 70, 80, because they have natural protection from uh, a cataract. cataracts. <laughs> cataract. 
<laughs> wow. That's exactly That's right. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. So blue light is extremely harmful to younger mm-hmm. people, especially mm-hmm. children. So if you have a hyper child who's a toddler and they won't sleep, that's the number one reason why, because the lights are on before, you know, when it's dark. So that that transition time of when it's dark outside and how much brightness is in your house is telling you it's a proxy for how much melatonin is being suppressed in the brain. Wow. And unfortunately, we're a modern society. And so we're all suppressing. So blue light blocking glasses, blue light filter on your computer screen, turning everything down to night mode, turning down the lights in the house. It's all disruptive to your melatonin, right? There's people who take melatonin to try to compensate for that. You just have to make sure it's pure melatonin because there's a lot of phony melatonins out there. Yeah. And, And so that the sleep issue has to be fixed. In fact, that's a really good point, Dr. Powell, because I will usually ask my clients, what is your sleep like? Hmm. I know that if I'm dealing with someone who's a very severe insomniac, hmm. I have to fix that first before I can expect any results. Exactly. From exactly. exactly. Yeah. I have to fix that first. So we go through and we look at their lifestyle. Hmm. We look at how much melatonin suppression might be going on. We look at even supplements and I won't get into that right. on yeah. your channel here, but there are supplements that I work with, with some people to try to get their nervous system to just calm down. There's a lot of, it's very individualized. The insomnia mm-hmm. has different causes for each person, but you know, as long as it's not sleep apnea, you know, where they need to go yes. and see a sleep doctor, yeah. we can go through the lifestyle changes. We can identify what they need to get that, you know, noggin just to shut off at night, because that's usually the number one reason is someone will say they're exhausted. They lay down to go to bed and then you think you're going to fall asleep, but then your eyes are open and you're like thinking about all the things that you, all the problems you have to solve. They so, can yeah. fall, fall asleep and also maintain their sleep as well. Maintaining sleep. Maintaining, maintaining sleep. sleep as well. Now, oftentimes there could be environmental disruption that's causing um, sleep disruption in the middle of the night, especially if that awakening is between 2 and 4 a.m. We talked about this, the Bluetooth radiation. And uh, I know I know that you switch off your phone and you have I... to put your phone in a locker. <laughs> You know, the best thing to do is, is they, they make these like Asian, they used to put them in these tins, these Asian cakes that would come in like a really pretty metal tin, you know? And and now, now people are going to say, the comments are going to be like, Dr. Julie, get your aluminum hat on, you know, or something, but, but like you can stick your phone in a tin like that, you know, just like a cookie tin. Right. And then it totally shuts off. Now I know the problem is a lot of people, are expecting, you know, they, they want to be prepared for a call. call. So that is the problem. And when, you know, we all understand that is that, well, if you, you know, you have a son or daughter that lives far away and you don't want to miss a call from them in case it's an emergency. So in those cases, there's not really a lot people can do. They can't just shut off their phone. So just try to keep it, you know, farther away from where mm-hmm. you sleep. keep it in a, you know, if, if possible, keep it as far away as possible. Right. Um, but those background uh, disruptions can can certainly also affect melatonin level. I so see. your melatonin secreting and then all of a sudden there's, it's almost like someone turns on a light. I see. So those background frequencies can be like someone switching on a light, at least to your brain. And I that see. will knock the melatonin level down. Yeah, it's a little bit more complicated to treat because then we have to go through and identify what what is the proxy for the light coming on in a person's household. <laughs> I think we should be like a house MD going into the house. <laughs> <laughs> and then what's going on? So uh, I had patients like this. And then um, I have seen as well that when they decrease their dinner time and they decrease their fast e- eating window, this thing changes. It takes time, but it does change. I think the melatonin production increases. Oh, yes. Basis, exactly what yes. Time restricted eating will it, it across the board, that's the number one piece of feedback that our clients and our patients have said is that I think my sleep's improved. I mean, uh, we don't even prompt them. We don't even mm-hmm, prompt them. That's the first mm-hmm. thing they notice. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if I could say this on your channel because I know you're, this is like this is supposed to be rated G, but I had a woman just last week who came back to me and she said, Dr. Julie, my libido has come back using time restricted <laughs> And then the first thought I had was because her sleep has improved, oh, right? She's mm-hmm. she. So even if someone's not complaining of disrupted sleep, 
they will get deeper sleep. And they, and they and you can't know what level your sleep's in, you know, alpha, whatever, whatever wave. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's probably mm-hmm. the wrong wavelength. But but you don't know what how what depth your brain is in in sleep. There's no way you can gauge that. I mean, some people can wear apps and things like that, but but the depth of sleep is the most important. How Deep. how really asleep you are. Right. And that's what time restricted eating changes. And when you change that for someone, you get their their sleep from like light mode to very deep mode, they wake up feeling much more energized. And mm-hmm. I think that's why this lady reported what she was reporting. I was, she was so happy. I mean, I was. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I think, so but do you have patients where you refer to a sleep specialist or um, you think that with this method, it will get better? Well, for, for, well, I don't, I, you know, they, they're not my patients, but if I suspect sleep apnea, I will let their primary care doctor know. A lot of these patients I'm seeing are, I'm just seeing them as like a consultant. Right, right. right, right. So um, most of them have come to me being screened already. For all right, sleep okay, apnea. okay. Yeah, okay. So for sure, if someone's, um, and this is what I do to check for sleep apnea is I ask them to either record themselves. I so see. you can put your phone on record. It will record for like, 10, 12 hours, like just put it on voice memo and record, leave it next to your bed. And then you'll play it back. You can play it back to speed. So it'll take you half the time to listen to it. (laughs) But you can hear if you're snoring, you know, you can hear or you can hear if you're mouth breathing. Mm. And that's the most important thing is are they mouth breathing? And, and people won't associate snoring and mouth breathing as being two similar problems. Yes. Um, but that mouth breathing is not deep sleep at all. Right. And you won't, you may not hear anything other than a, other right. than, than a breathy kind of sound when mm. someone's sleeping. So that's important to check is, is there a mechanical sleep problem? I, I consider see. that I a see. mechanical problem I because see. the jaw needs to come forward mm. in order for the airway to open. And so, you know, there's, there's a CPAP machine, there's appliances people can wear, there's things you can wear in your mouth, sometimes people tape. But yeah, that's a mechanical disruption that's causing the insomnia and the daytime fatigue. So yeah, Just I, a small uh, personal experience is that, you know, mouth taping actually helped me. Ah. So I used to tape my mouth at night before going to bed because I was a mouth breather. Now I'm training my um, uh, nerves to uh, breathe through my nose. Um, and it's absolutely working great for my marriage. <laughs> No problems. The best ever decision. (laughs) Does your wife tell you to start the mouth taping during the day? (laughs) That's it. We don't talk. No arguments. Nothing. You just nod. (laughs) But actually it works. It really works. It's only like, you know, in Amazon, it's only like $10 or something like that. I just tape it. I'm telling you the amount of oxygen that I um, take it through the nose is much, much better than take it through your more oral cavity. And I feel a lot energetic in the morning. I can see a difference. Are you using the, like, which brand are you using? It's got a little opening or something in it? Um, this is, this one is just a run of, run of the mill, like Amazon brand. Um, okay. It just, it's like a X over here. Oh, wow. Right? So yeah. I, I don't have it, but um, it's basically just telling my wife that don't talk to me. <laughs> Or that, or that she can talk to you, and now all you can do is listen. That's exactly, perfect. yeah. Now you're the perfect husband. <laughs> now she's saying that give it to me, and then you talk. <laughs> so, but I think I think uh, so. To all the listeners who have been listening to this, please make sure that if you have insomnia or you're not losing weight, please talk to your doctor to see whether the mechanical obstruction might be the first reason. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, we have a wonderful discussion so far. We've been like 50 minutes already. I I, I didn't even know the time has flight so fast. Um, I wanted to ask you. Um, I know you have this book on time restricted eating. Um, um, can you tell a little bit more about the book explaining what are the other things that go you, uh, that, that you go deeply into the book? Uh, and then uh, if you have a copy, you can show it to us as well. Sure. Yeah. So what the book really talks about is, is the things that people are seeing in their life after adopting this protocol of time, of time restricted eating. And so what I talk about in the book is, is kind of like the primary care problems of hypertension how people can come off medication Mm. and 
diabetes, how people can normalize or improve their blood sugars so that they can use less medication mm -hmm. or in pre-diabetics, how to avoid medication. Now, I think a lot of people might think of it as, oh, well, you know, it's a lifestyle change. It would sort of be like saying, oh, she's just saying exercise and diet will get these diseases better. It's really not that at all. Mm -hmm. It's actually that if you use time-restricted eating for this specific window of time and for this period of time. So the example I use in the book is a case of a truck driver and we lowered his blood pressure by more than 50 points in less than two weeks on time restricted eating. So there's a very clear and definite outcome with a very clear and definite eating time and fasting window. Nice. And it's slightly different for everybody. But that one example is it gives people the hope to know they can correct this problem themselves. Nice. That you don't have to be, you know, chained to medication for the rest of your life. And I just, these cases with hypertension just blow me away. And I do this over and over and over with um, patients is that mm. we adjust their eating time. And the truck driver story I love because he's someone who's on the road all the time. All the he time. doesn't have time to stop and have like a breakfast and a mm. lunch and then a nice dinner, but he's still able to organize his day so that he gets most of his eating done during the day. He stops eating after dinner and that's all he had to change. And, you know, getting him to normal blood pressure allowed him to pass his physical right. so he could be driving, you know, right. otherwise he'd be unemployed oh, right yeah. now. We wouldn't nice. have a merchandise. Nice. So, so these, this small component of releasing this embedded default system in the body is not only helping people lose weight, but it is helping them correct disease. And in the case of diabetes, we can, diabetes is more complicated because mm -hmm. I don't just have my patients and clients change their eating and fasting interval. We do have to move the time of medication around, mm. which I'm not breaking any rules because all it says on their bottle is AM and PM. Take <laughs> this medication AM and then PM. And so as long as it's AM and PM, we haven't, you know, I haven't gone against the doctor's recommendation. You're talking about insulin or oral tablets? All. All, okay. All. okay. <laughs> But, but, you know, when, when we start shifting this around, we find the time that the medication works the best and, and then the food comes in around the time of the medication as well. So there's a couple of different targets we're trying to hit with diabetes. So it's a little mm -hmm. bit more complicated and I do a one-on-one -on -one kind of coaching with that. But um, once we get them in range for both the medicines and the food, you can see their hypoglycemic events go away. I mean, they just disappear. Nice. And it's like one diabetic told me, she said, Dr. Julie, I thought I was destined to have hypoglycemic events for the rest of my life. Wow. That's what a diabetic is, is most, it, that's the most disruptive to their day right. is when mm. they go low. Because yes. then they got to recover, you know, they're like exhausted. Right. When they go high, they may not necessarily feel it unless they're very, very high. But when they go low, that's just like drags you down. And so she went from having several episodes a week to zero. Wow. To zero. Nice. And, and it just changed her life. And she knew, you know, even if she, even if she started to fall off the wagon, you know, even she, she did, she went off time restricted eating. She knew she could recorrect mm. she knew she could get right back on track. Mm. And when they no longer have lows and they no longer have the high highs, they are no longer going down that path of the risk of chronic diabetes, mm. you know, nerve damage and worrying about the uh, losing, uh, you know, limbs and, and damage to the body. I mean, all of that starts to go away when you lose the lows and you lose the very high highs mm. and your numbers just start to come in to mm. almost normal range or normal range. Mm. Yeah. And that is, that is possible. It's nice. possible with time restricted eating. Nice. In fact, it's so possible. Anyone who commits to it can do it. I see. Nice, nice. So patience. So if you if you have patience, we will not have patience. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> oh, and I'll show you the book. Oh, good, nice. That's on Amazon. And this eating, good, beautiful. You yeah, have a cup it, and saucer. What does it mean? What's that? You have a coffee cup and a saucer. Oh, the coffee cup. the The coffee cup signifies how you take that cup of coffee in the morning. And that's the beginning of your eating window, right? Because 
everyone thinks I don't start eating breakfast till 10 or noon. So I'm already, I'm still fat. No, uh, 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 uh. Right, right. that first beverage, whether it's coffee, even tea, tea breaks the breaks the fasting. Now it doesn't break it like as bad as having like a croissant. That's true, right. uh -huh. but you are breaking the fasting interval. So, so that coffee cup represents understanding this whole idea of fasting and eating it's a water fast you're you're having water whenever you, you know during your fasting interval right. but as soon as it's something other than water now you're in the eating time frame which is not bad you just have to know where your eating window is and where you want it to end if it was my book i would have put biryani which is a very indian special dish i'm not sure that you all know it i can send you a picture you will definitely have it at your lunch time <laughs> 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 okay, book two, I'll put the Briani on the yeah. cover. <laughs> but anyways, we'll put your link for the book in the uh, description and please check that out. Again, thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. It's been a wonderful session. And uh, thank you again for your time. Sure. Sure, Dr. Fell. Thank you.